but we understood something about what it means to be from this planet and to be ourselves mm. and the ways we set up our societies. And we understood what health and illness were. And this beautiful quote from an, a, half an, uh, a part indigenous uh, psychiatrist colleague of my father's who says that in, in his tradition, the Lakota tradition, when someone gets sick in the community, the community is grateful for it and they gather around because they see that as an expression of something going on with them. Mm. That's just that's just intelligent. Yeah. That's yeah. just I mean that's just sensible really if we come mm. to all of our senses. Yeah, and as far as a love letter to the world, I love that. I mean, if you think what what is a love letter? You don't tell someone stuff they already know about themselves in a love letter. You tell them what you see mm. and you tell them you 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 mirror back to them their possibilities and who they are for you and in a sense what they're capable of you 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 render them in the most generous expansive poetic language that leaves them with a different experience of themselves and that's a big part of what love is about mm -hmm. so yeah i mean by the end of this book after we get done cataloging all of the fucked up things about how we live and about the about life now mm -hmm. what we are pointing to i hope and i think is we are capable of so much more, you know, at yeah. least we have it in us, mm. whatever it is, we have it in us. And um, the world could be so many different ways, whether it will or not, we'll see, but why not live as if it could be and why not try, because it's just, it's just so much more enlivening, even if it's doomed. Yeah. It's, um, it's a living death to just be resigned to what's so, what's already predictable. Hi, I'm Stephanie Dano, and welcome to Unknowingly Connected, a podcast for people open and curious by nature with specific interests in the human potential and the greater good. Twice a month, I interview professionals who have gathered their diverse passions or gifts to be in service of human leadership. You will hear from their journey and their techniques crafted to be within everyone's reach and explained from a scientific, body-mind and spiritual perspective. It's all connected and we might not even know it. Hi, today I have the pleasure to talk to Daniel Maté. Daniel is a composer, lyricist and playwright for musical theatre. Daniel has been working for the last 10 years with his dad, Gabor, on all of his audiobooks and also on the workshop Hello Again, a first start for parents and their adult children. Recently, he has co-written the book The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness and Healing in a Toxic Culture, along with his dad, Gabor. It's a really interesting conversation for me, as you may have seen around, there's a lot of interviews with Gabor Mate, and I wanted to know a little bit Daniel's experience to co-write his book, and also other conversation around relationship with parents, healing, healing as a man, and our interconnected nature. I hope you enjoy because it's a very rich interview. Enjoy. Uh, good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Stephanie. So, um, first of all, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, I have received from some of my colleagues a lot of surprise and expectation from this uh, interview because a lot of people know Gabor, your dad, but I mm -hmm. thought there was a lot of interesting topic to talk to you in particular. So, so there. Well, I'm honored <laughs> to be here. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Um, I usually start, always start with the beginning. So kind of where you're from, and what brought you to do what you do now? 
The first thing, I'm going to try to see if I got it right. So I guess you were born and raised in Vancouver? Yes. Okay. I, I tried to find out your age. <laughs> I was guessing like 75. 75? No, 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 75. You were born in 75, sorry. <laughs> I was born. <laughs> yes, I was born in 1975. In fact, the day we're recording this yesterday, September 28th, was my birthday. Oh, great. Oh, happy birthday. There you go. Yeah, so yeah. you and your listeners can do the math. But yeah. uh, not quite not quite 75. Hmm. Okay. No, not yet. Um. So, eldest of three children yes yes the eldest of three uh i have a brother and a sister and actually both of uh all three of us now live in here in brooklyn new york oh great um for the first time in 30 years we're all living in the same city which is pretty cool oh that's great and yeah. um so the thing i know is your mom ray is an artist painter yes. yeah yes and, a really wonderful one yeah and and your dad so you were born when your dad was still studying in medical school, am I right? Yes, I believe that's true. Um, he was somewhere, he was, I think when I was one or two, he start, He became like an intern or he did his residency. Mm -hmm. We moved to Montreal for a couple of years when he did that. Mm. Um, and my mom, when she got pregnant with me, she quit her job as a third grade teacher. Mm. Um, and that's... You know, in the aftermath of that, after raising me for a while, she went back to art school and became a professional painter. My dad, one thing a lot of people don't know is before he decided to become a doctor, was a grade 11 teacher. Mm. He taught he taught history and literature, maybe. I forget. Mm -hmm. But he was, mm. uh, yeah, he was like a guitar playing renegade. A guitar playing, teacher. really? Uh, do you know yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. He, would bring his <laughs> he would bring his guitar into class and give hand out like percussion instruments to the class because they were like basically an ADHD filled class. Mm, this is in yeah. the early seventies before that was really a term, but he recognized that I think intuitively that probably because he related to that kind of mind mm. that what they needed was engagement and relationship and an outlet for creativity rather than strict discipline, which, mm. you know, you can't impose that except by force or, uh, medication. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had a he had a knack for connecting with, um, with just sort of the the chaos and <laughs> uh, and, and turning it to, to everyone's advantage. Mm. Oh, that's great. Um, and then what I saw is that you studied philosophy and psychology. Am I right? Or something like that? Yeah, I I did. Uh, a psychology bachelor's of arts at McGill in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I spiced it up with uh, a minor in philosophy and also English literature. The choice of psychology was, I mean, there are no mistakes, right? That's mm -hmm. the spiritual truism, but it was a mistake. Uh, as far as my happiness and fulfillment was concerned, it was a default choice. Yeah, uh, I arrived in university not really having a sense of what university was for, what I wanted out of it. I think I was treating it like an extension of high school and I just wanted to excel. And I had done so well in my international baccalaureate program in, in high school in Vancouver that McGill gave me a full year scholarship off, which was mm -hmm. disastrous for me because it meant I didn't get to do a freshman survey. I didn't get to do, you know, what everyone else did, which is take a whole bunch of different courses, try things, do languages. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make a decision on my literal first day in Montreal and I think by default, not just because my father was interested in psychology at the time, although he wasn't writing on the topic, he was just a, he was still a, a medical doctor, mm -hmm. but also because I had this desire to figure myself out and understand human psychology. And I liked having deep talks with people about personal problems and stuff. I've never been much for small talk. It's like, I go straight to the deep stuff, which is socially awkward sometimes, um, <laughs> So I, I I sort of defaulted to, okay, I'll do a psychology degree. The error in that, one of the errors in that was that that's not at all what McGill psychology was about. McGill psychology was really anxious to see itself as a hard science. Mm. So neuroscience, uh, statistics, um, social psychology experiments, all that. We didn't get to Freud until year three. And then when we did, it was dismissive. 
you know, like that, that old, that old lunatic whose, whose views have been fully discredited. You can't prove the unconscious and all this stuff. Hmm. So, and, and, you know, actually the, and philosophy turned me on a lot more. And I was really hoping that I could do a joint major, a Hmm. double major in psychology and philosophy. Hmm. And I took the idea to the philosophy department and they were like, that's great. I went to the psychology department, my main department, and the head of the program said to me, point blank, uh, you can't do that. I said, why not? He said, because psychology is not an empirical science. If you want to do a double major in psychology and economics, you can. Hmm. And that gave me a window into the fact that the psychological trade, the, the business, the industry of psychology in our society is far more interested in predicting and controlling behavior Mm -hmm. for the benefit of the status quo and advertisers and businesses and corporations and uh you know clinicians too than it is at getting at root causes emotions human beings and the nature of existence Mm -hmm. and life which is was my whole uh interest so it was deeply frustrating and i dropped out uh in fourth year with a kind of nervous breakdown like i had a very very deep depression Mm. and i couldn't complete it one of the ways i kept myself sane during those four years was to do a lot of theater and music which ended up being um sort of a clue as to what would um you know crack my code in terms of what i'm supposed to be doing here on this planet um, (laughs) in this life but that Mm. took me another seven or eight years to get over the trauma of an undergraduate experience that was really really turned me off formal mm. education yeah yeah gotcha so that's what brought you to doing lyrics and music then yeah, yeah eventually i mean what's really funny is that my whole life i've been doing music i have perfect pitch mm. i was born with a real musical ear uh, i've been playing piano since i was five writing my own music when I got the opportunity, when my classical piano teachers would allow it. And then eventually I ended up quitting classical piano lessons at age nine, because I just, I didn't want to fit that box. I didn't want to be a concert pianist. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be like a little 10 year old Elton John. Um, <laughs> uh, and then uh, theater was something I'd also always loved performing, playing roles, doing voices. And in high school, I started doing a lot of acting. Mm -hmm. And in university, I was actually one of the most active male actors on campus in terms of being cast in uh, productions on campus at various theaters, even though I wasn't in the theater department. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You know, and I only took one theater class uh, in all of my time at university, but I was just really motivated. I directed a play and that was a great experience. And then I was starting to learn guitar at the time. And now my influences were more like uh, Indigo Girls, Ani DeFranco, but also Metallica and Soundgarden. And, you know, I, I just, I was trying to find my own voice and I was starting to write my own songs with lyrics. Mm. And there were times when I would mix the two, like I was in a production of Tom Stoppard's Arcadia at McGill and uh we had this pretty famous russian director who came in and directed and he had me compose some music for the for the play and i wrote songs for a production of shakespeare's 12th night in vancouver a few years later Mm -hmm. so doing music and theater at the same time but not musical theater as it's typically understood which is the american tradition of theater pieces narrative pieces that use character songs Mm -hmm. to move the plot forward as the main event of the night, you know, whether it's West Side Story or Fiddler on the Roof or Sweeney Todd or Rent or Hamilton, right? Mm -hmm. That tradition. So, and I had all kinds of, uh, uh, frankly, prejudices about that art form. I thought it was corny. I thought it wasn't for me. Um, I just, uh, you know, I loved rock musicals like Little Shop of Horrors, and I'd seen Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which really moved me deeply. So that gave me an inkling that maybe it could be cool. You know, I I was really, I think I had a bit of a neurosis around coolness, probably still do. (laughs) Uh, um, But then it took me until my late twenties to finally allow in the thought, hmm, maybe these two things I love so much, music and theater might belong together. And it might be okay if I don't know so much about it, if I could just be a little humble and learn about it. And 
And more importantly, and it took some conversations with my mom, I, it where I stopped fighting her finally, because she kept trying to bring this up. You know, she'd say, Daniel, you're so talented. I can't believe you don't want to do your creative passions as a profession. And the minute I heard the word profession, it's like I got hives. I was like, mom, stop it. I'm so old fashioned. Stop imposing your standards on me and all this stuff. <laughs> and then finally, once after I had just done sort of a personal development program that kind of softened my rigid mind boundaries up, I heard her say it again. And I, I asked her to repeat it. And she did. And I said, oh, mom, you're just my biggest fan. She's like, duh. <laughs> and I, and within five months, I had found this little program at NYU, little but very expensive, uh, the Graduate Musical Theater Writing Program. Mm -hmm. And I had applied and been accepted. And that changed the course of my life. And that was mm -hmm. 2004, 2005. Mm -hmm. So I moved to New York and, and devoted myself to studying that. Okay. So that's been for about 15 years now, a bit more than that. Where right. did the mental chiropractic came yeah, well, that's an interesting story. Um, I mean, like I said, I've always had an interest in people. I've always had an interest in conversations that make a difference and that make an immediate difference. Mm. Uh, you know, coming out of a conversation, looking at things differently than one goes in and wanting to, this impulse to sort of help people and myself clarify things. You know, there's something about that moment of crystallization. Mm. Um, someone once called me a crystal soul, which I found very moving, even though I didn't quite know what it meant. She meant it as it's my destiny to like end the cycle of trauma or something, which is very, yeah. it's rather grandiose. But if I can do any of that, great. I mean, one way I'm doing it uh, is by not having kids yet. So that's one way to not pass it on to the next generation. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, first of all, it's not set in stone that I won't. And second of all, you know, there are other ways to to make that difference in the world. But yeah. but the other th aspect of the word crystal is that when things crystallize, that moment when someone gets something and it just becomes crystal clear and all of the complication and all of the mind stuff falls away and you just see a situation clearly. Mm. I love that when it happens for me. I love being witness to it in others. Yeah. So I've always had that ever since I was a kid. Um. I left New York in late 2014 mm -hmm. to embark on a new adventure or a new misadventure, as it were, which was to get engaged and married. And I married somebody. It was a very complicated situation. And, and someday I'll write about it. It's, it's such a good story with so many crazy chapters. But um, uh, she was an apprentice, basically, of my father in the ayahuasca mm -hmm. world. So there was already sort of a blurred boundary and I was, you know, I was getting involved with someone who was very um, much interested in continuing my dad's work and, and, and doing it herself. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten a bit disillusioned with my musical theater work at the time, despite the fact that just a year previous, I had won a hundred thousand dollar award as the most promising lyricist in American musical theater. I thought that would change my life. It didn't. And I found myself without much juice. I didn't have anything to write. And and I was very depressed, as I often have been in my adult life. And at this moment, this person came along and I got mm -hmm. swept up in it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I got swept up in was the ayahuasca world, yeah. which I had already done ayahuasca. And it had been a powerful healer and teacher for me. But it was sort of like going to the garage once a year to get your car tuned it was maintenance yeah. you know yeah. i didn't get deep into it but when i when i married this person all of a sudden i was doing a lot of ceremonies i was around people who spoke that language they were doing more than just ayahuasca but plant medicine as well like the yeah. whole vegetalismo tradition out of out of uh, south america so long story short we ended up apprenticing with my father uh, at some of his retreats in in uh, mexico and then she and i went and co-led um a retreat in peru mm -hmm. at a place that my father has written about and during that retreat you know during the day after the ceremonies we'd sit with people in a circle and help them make sense of their experiences in the ceremonies and she had her approach, which was very much in line with my father's. And then I was kind of doing my own thing. And one of the participants said, Daniel, you know, it's, you're not a therapist. I said, damn right, I'm not a therapist. 
They said, you're not, you don't work like your father does. I said, I'm glad to hear that. But what is it that I do? He said, you're kind of a mental chiropractor. Hmm. And that crystallized something for me, you know, like I saw myself all of a sudden, I recognized myself in that term because there's a kind of immediacy to it. There's a forcefulness to it. There's an interest in just getting in there and intervening. Like my father, as you know, hmm. being a practitioner and student of compassionate inquiry, his whole method is to sit patiently with somebody and inquire compassionately into their deepest hurt and pain and then be with them and just help gently guide them. I have no interest in being gentle or patient. I want to get to it right now, which means I'm not going to take on your deepest wounds. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, like I take for granted that everyone's traumatized. I am uh, you. I mean, it, okay, I see sure. it. You can see it. I don't need to tell someone, Oh, you were hurt as a child. What I want to know is how is that hurt mucking you up in the present? How is it clouding your view of a particular situation that you feel stuck in and how, what can we do to get your mind aligned as a chiropractor would a spine mm -hmm. getting the nerves working you know in a relaxed way getting the vertebrae uh stacked on top of each other in a comfortable and maximally efficacious way so that really resonated mm -hmm. okay mental chiropractor i can do that but i didn't know how to like brand that i'm, I'm terrible at branding um or at least i don't think in those terms generally um, and then it took me a few years, a few years until I was walking with a friend one day and he said, you know, you're really good at walking with people. We were having basically a mental chiropractic conversation about a situation that he was really struggling with. And it was seemingly superficial, but it was touching some of his deepest wounds, you know, and yeah. that's what I love. You know, I love working on those, those seemingly surface things that, that are expressions of the, of the deeper stuff. Yeah. And I said, oh, I'm good at walking with people. It's true. I love to walk. I do my best thinking and reasoning when I'm walking. It's integrated with emotion. Both hemispheres are going. I'm moving my body. I'm changing literally my point of view with every step. I'm out in nature, which is always aligned with itself, mm. which is a nice model for us, you know. And so I created this thing called Walk with Daniel, walkwithdaniel.com for anyone listening. Um <laughs> which I call the world's only mental chiropractic service. So I take walks with people, usually remotely, because I get clients from all over the world. Uh, I'm walking with someone in Reykjavik tomorrow and <laughs> Los Angeles the next day. You know, it's really cool. Mm. But also in person, if I happen to be in the same city. Yeah. Um, and we do a mental chiropractic session. And, you know, true to the concept of it, if we can't get unstuck in an hour and a half, I'm not interested in doing it. Like I had to end a call 20 minutes into it last weekend. I had to say to this person, look, I honor where you're at. It sounds like you're going through something really difficult and important. And I'm not the person to help you with it. It's too diffuse. It's too general. It's too therapy-like. Yeah. And I just, because if I'm not enjoying it, if I'm not loving it, I'm no good. Mm -hmm. no good. A, so I've got, I've had to get, I've had to get really clear on the difference between my gifts, for instance, and my father's gifts, which is itself a really good individuation yeah. um, exercise. Yeah. And really interesting. And I would say even complimentary to my, well, and, and that is borne out by the fact that when we're on stage together as equal collaborators, as we are in our hello again workshop, which yeah. is for parents and their adult children, which I can talk about if you like, um, well, we, at our best, we complement each other beautifully because mm -hmm. his work is like a deep massage yeah. that, that brings things up. And then my work is like, all right, while you're supple, while you're loose, let's get you into some kind of alignment and have you looking at the present in a, in a sharper focused way so that you're not just leaving with, oh, wow. Okay. You know, mm. I connected with my emotions, but like, okay, my mind is, is sharp now and I'm seeing the situation clearly. I think the mind actually gets a bad rap in spiritual psychological circles. Hmm. You know, if, if all you do is listen to Eckhart Tolle, then the instruction is just observe the mind <laughs> and watch the thoughts, you know, and let it pass. It's all temporary and 
connect with the pain body and all this. It's good stuff. It's really good stuff. I don't really practice it, but it's really good stuff. I can tell it's powerful (laughs) and transformative, getting people into the present moment. However, you can do that all you want. But as far as I'm concerned, you're still going to have to go back into your regular life. Yeah. And you can have as many psychedelic peak experiences as you want, but you're still going to have to go into your regular life with the contents of your mind and the structure of your mind. And unless you really take that on, you're likely to look at things and interpret things in the same old ways. Yeah. Have, you know, and your and your coping pat- patterns are made up of mental structures, assumptions, reactions, prejudices and they create a pattern so to intervene in that can be a very powerful complement to that softer, more long-term kind of work. Yeah, yeah. I find it really useful what you're saying because, oh, how can I say, a lot of people stay into the narrative. of, And then you have your daily life and you have things to do and things to solve and and that's where we're at. So, yeah. Do, do you find that people get, in your work, that, that people can get lost in like, even the trauma narrative or the healing narrative, There's, like it becomes a bit of a bit of a vortex. So it depends on. Uh, I work with um, also something called the enneagram. So actually, I've I love from, the enneagram. Oh my god! There you go. What type are you? <laughs> what type are you? I'm I'm two. I'm a helper, full on. And I'm a four. <laughs> oh, you look for me. I would say a three. Huh? Guess what? What is the what is the three? Three is. Um, performer like achiever and uh so it's also from a heart space but there's yeah. something a bit more sharp than a type four for some reason interesting i'll have to look into that i you know i might be a four with a three wing yeah exactly uh, or a three with a four wing <laughs> yeah i mean it's such a and my father's clearly a one you know mm. um the advocate the yeah the, the synthesizer all this it's such a wonderful model. I mean, I'm I'm inclined to think personality models are kind of corny. Yeah, I don't like it either. Yeah. But the whoever figured out the Enneagram was really onto something, especially the relationships between the things, what happens when two different types get together, and especially for me, the levels of development, which means that every single one of the nine types can be a disastrous, either suicidal or homicidal blight on the world and to themselves Mm -hmm. and very destructive Mm -hmm. and every single one of them can transcend the limitations of their type and become you know pure light and and contribute and sort of soften the boundaries between them so mine Mm -hmm. for instance the four the individualist if that's indeed what i am Mm -hmm. at the middle range of development you know i'm really focused on my uniqueness and my specialness Mm -hmm. which is 100 percent the the guiding compass point of my identity how am i different yeah for good and for ill Hmm. but at the higher levels the four can use their individuality as a means to expose universals and to connect with others and show others their individuality and in so doing you create you're contributing to the universal consciousness yeah which is what the best artists do and that's what i aspire to do That, that would make my make my life if I could, if I could achieve that. Yeah, absolutely. So, but, but the thing is to answer your question is, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. You're real good. I guess I, mean, I have the, I guess I have the enthusiast in me too, which is my mom's <laughs> type, I think. Yeah. No, it's just like, I think there's, there are some people who, um, but actually you, normally the type four, like I, I call it feel the feelings when people love to long into the emotions and then sometimes they long into the past and the trauma and it's sometimes it's hard to make them like okay you're here now let's do something but um but it depends yeah, and that's a matter of intention right yeah without a clear intention you're going to default into something yeah whether absolutely. it's fantasy about the future or indulging feelings from the past or just drifting into old behaviors and stagnating you know absolutely which, for me is a kind of purgatory I don't want to live in. Mm-mm-mm, absolutely. Um, going back to um, your recent news, um, the book, The Myth of Normal, it's called mm-hmm. Myth of Normal. Oh, you've got it here. I couldn't have wow, it on paper I because I, it would come like tomorrow. So, but I read it. Oh, good. <laughs> you read it already, what, online or something? Yeah, online, yeah. Oh, okay. So for folks who... Uh, 
like me don't enjoy reading anymore because they've been spoiled by this tech culture or they just happen to like the silky sound of my voice i am the voice of the audiobook and you can get that everywhere yeah, exactly. as well and the audiobook is selling like hotcakes i'm really well it's like podcast that. it's wonderful you know like to, to yeah, and, and you can do it while walking right or taking long road trips that's when i love listening to audiobooks yeah absolutely. but anyway you're asking about the book yeah so the thing is so first of all is um regarding your biography it seems like it's been like kind of 10 years you've been working with your dad through the audiobooks no. A little bit less. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I mean, even before that, I was an editor on In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. Yep. I had a hand in revising, spicing up, doing some light renovations on the text of that. And I wrote about a two or three page little open letter to him in mm. in a later chapter in that book. Uh, he's always valued my lyrics lyricist mind you know in terms of making the prose really snappy and clear and mm. and then yeah i started narrating his audiobooks in the early 2010s and i mm. did all previous four of them yeah. he's been working on this book for at least 10 years yeah. compiling all kinds of evidence and research and you know but he didn't have a good title for a long time and then it was about four or five years ago that he that he crystallized the idea of the myth of normal mm. Um, and very shortly afterwards, once he got himself a big time New York agent and, you know, she said, okay, let's get this book proposal together. And he wrote a book proposal and he showed it to my mom and she was just like, oh, this is torture. This is just, <laughs> and so, uh, he sent it to me and I looked at it and I said, okay, well, great. Um, I actually see what this could be but you need a lot of help. <laughs> so I'm going to need to be more than your editor this time. Mm. And that's when our formal collaboration really started, you know, with me as accredited okay. co-author. Great. Is there, because this I understood, and actually I took a quote from your dad when he was in the, in the Hello Again workshop at, like a few years ago. And he said, like, it's everything that I've learned, but I couldn't, have been doing it without my son and his support. Uh, mm. The thing is, my question is like, apart from helping him, is there anything that motivated you in particular in this book? Well, it was an opportunity to be a published author. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't in my wildest dreams think we would debut at number five on the New York Times bestseller list, which we yeah. did. Yeah. And at the time of this recording, we're holding steady at number six. Uh, but just to, I love writing. I just love writing and the chance to have more leeway in really shape, not just phrasing things like a lyricist, but shaping things like a playwright. Like what's the story we're telling here? How do I make these arguments really persuasive and rigorous? I mean, again, going back to my philosophy education, I loved reading writers who were very, very careful in the way they made arguments. And my dad is many things, but he's not particularly careful in his argumentation because when he looks at the world, he just sees it's obvious, like trauma causes illness or leads to illness. Uh, everyone's traumatized, med the medical profession, this, all this and that, right? And that's a really valuable perspective. It's someone who can speak in no uncertain terms. As the more artist type, I like the ambivalence, the, the acknowledgement of gray areas, but I also really value you know respecting the argument respecting the audience enough to say okay you may not be with me yet let's look at this from all different points of view and mm. come to a really fair and again i'm just keep this word keeps coming up uh in my language you might even want to use it in the title of this episode <laughs> you know it's crystal crystallized yes mm -hmm. you know um so that excited me the chance because and and the other aspect of it is I really believe in my dad's work. Mm -hmm. And then just on a personal level, I wanted to see him finally succeed. Not that he hadn't succeeded. He was a bestseller in Canada and becoming very well known all over the world. But as far as the US book market mm -hmm. and breaking into the, any kind of mainstream recognition, no, he had been a cult, a cult classic and and uh, a grassroots word of mouth sort of author mm -hmm. and speaker. Um, and I thought, I think his ideas deserve mainstream recognition, especially with a title like The Myth of Normal. 
Yeah. This is not a niche subject. And it's not just for people who are already aboard, you know, the trauma caravan, right. people who are already doing the kind of work that your clients do and that you do. It, it should be for everybody at, at whatever <laughs> level of entry. So that seemed to me like a very challenging and exciting endeavor. And I think then on an unconscious level, I intuited that it would be a healing thing as well to work with him. I had always been frustrated that he didn't see me as an equal, but of course, that's not something that can be forced or imposed that is developed that with, you know, a rite of passage you mm. know, in a healthy culture, you know, I, this would have happened when I was 14 yeah. and we would never be equals. He's my father, but he would see me as a man, as an adult, as a peer of some kind. And this project became as it should have um, a way in which that could express itself because he had to trust me. He had to let go of some control mm. and knowing everything. And he had to listen to me and that, and I had to learn not to take shit personally. Yeah. You know, including times when his voice would be raised and it would remind me of what he used to sound like when I was a kid and I'd get my back up and all my trauma triggers are popping off. I had to bring my focus back to, okay, what is this for? What are we doing? What's our intention? Yeah, And when I did that, I found, okay, well, it's not all that serious. He's just insecure, which itself was a discovery. Oh my God, Dr. Gabor Mate is an insecure mess sometimes. Yes. And <laughs> that gave me, you know, more compassion for him. Yeah, And it, it lightened my view of all of the craziness. Mm, so, so it was a lot of things for me. Mm. Um, and, you know, I can't say I wasn't also cognizant of the fact that if this book sold well, I'd be getting some passive income for the first time in my life. Yeah. And it would set me up to <laughs> be able to actually afford the artist life that I've been aspiring to, you know, to mm -hmm. actually invest in my musicals and, you know, take four months off and write a new one and all this kind of stuff and not be dependent on the nonprofit, um, you know, arts or governmental arts funding world as much as I might be. So, there were so many incentives. It was a slam dunk. It was a, it was just an obvious thing to do. The only question in my mind is, can I? Yeah. But I never really doubted that. Hmm. So it actually leads me to something I wanted to talk about, which leads to, which is the same as the workshop you're doing with um, Hello Again, mm -hmm. is the evolving relationship you have with a parent. Yes. And when I listen to the workshop that is available on YouTube, I mean, the ones that from a few years ago, for me, it seems that as if there were like three levels. And the first one is the one you described very well, which is like I, someone who can't let go of the illusion that a parent can change or it can be different, right? Or holding to the fantasy of it, of how it could be. And I think it happened to most of the lay people. And then there's the second level, which I've seen many times in the personal development world, which is, okay, I grieve this ideal, but then I just let go. It's a kind of abandonment of, you know what, my parents are, they are, and just let it be. But it seems to me you're like in the third level, which is a constant evolution of the relationship you have with your parents. Yeah. And... But the, but the thing it came to me is like, it seems that for you, it's a custom test that you're having with it relationship. And, and you mentioned in this workshop that regarding your parents, you thought that there was always the third actor who was the relationship between them. Mm -hmm. But now it seems to me you have like a fourth actor in the play, which is the public. Because mm -hmm. the public have a lot of opinion. <laughs> now you've done this book together which is some people who, of course, love Gabor and his work, or some people who may, like, project through the relationship that with their dad with you. So I'm just curious about how you deal with that now. <laughs> I'm really glad you asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I really don't want that fourth actor to get much further than the, the front porch, you know? Mm -hmm. Um my siblings actually bless them and their wisdom. When I first started doing this work with my dad publicly, they really warned me. They said, don't confuse the public performance with the real relationship. It's a representation of the relationship. You're 
mining the relationship consciously to share with people, but it's about the people. It's about their lives and don't get caught up in your persona or how people perceive you or the illusion that if you have a deep conversation with your dad on stage or you have some seeming breakthrough that that is the real thing and they're a hundred percent right mm -hmm. it is very very um seductive uh especially for someone with look at me tendencies like myself i could use the other n-word you know narcissism but uh <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be a little softer on myself than that. Uh, it's very seductive to, um, to see myself through other people's eyes mm. and for good and for bad. I mean, I can't tell you how many messages I get or comments I see when I do look at the comments sometimes, and I do it just sort of to entertain myself try not to take it seriously. I, I had to tell my dad the other, he, he was, <laughs> we were in a hotel together in Toronto. He's like, listen to this comment on, on the Rogan podcast or on the Democracy Now podcast. And someone just totally dismissing him as a kook or whatever. I'm like, dad, the first rule of the internet is don't read the comments. <laughs> and I yeah. think that's a good rule for him, point blank. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit more YouTube uh, internet literate, so I can filter yeah. it out. But I mean, even then it's, but if you actually read the comments on our YouTube channel, a certain portion of them, uh, you know, when on these hello again workshops, maybe a third of them say, oh, Daniel is such a brat. He's spoiled. <laughs> he's narcissistic. He clearly doesn't respect his father. He's or he's, uh, you know, desperate for his father's attention. He's acting like a child. Why are we listening to this guy? I so much prefer Gabor. And I've had people say this to me. Yeah. Um, the other way around. In workshops, you know, mm. Um uh, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about that in a second. Uh, and I, and I get people also DMing me, Oh, I wish Gabor was my dad and all this. And I'm just like, Ugh, go away. Like <laughs> hashtag King Gabor. I'm like, please no stop. Then some of the, uh, and I get it. People love him. They're grateful to him. I understand. I get it. I truly do. But look at what happens with gurus in this world. Look at happens when people idealize somebody, it never ends well. And it's not good for the guru, huh. you know? even the most spiritually enlightened person has an ego. Um, another section of the comments say, oh my God, I never thought Gabor could be such an asshole. He is undermining his son on stage. He's dark and depressed and he's sucking the energy out of the conversation. And he's, uh, or maybe I'm, Maybe now I'm, I'm projecting a little bit about what I would comment sometimes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, people see a dark side yeah, to the relationship yeah. and they see the ways that I get I, that I can be hurt mm -hmm. and the ways that I can feel rejected by his behavior and the ways he can be harsh and punitive. And all those things are also part of the truth. And then the other third are like, oh, they're both so great. And maybe a few of them are like, oh, my God, if I wanted this, I'd just go to my family Thanksgiving. This is garbage. And turn off. <laughs> But what that means is, what's funny about that is that it's none of it, like there's no objective reality. It's all perception. Yeah. And people probably are looking through their own projections, desires, fantasies, fears, shames, and all that. And that's a service we can provide to be up there as a couple of people, people can project onto. But what's crucial is that we turn the projector back onto them mm. and be like, okay, your perspective is coming from your perspective and you don't see your perspective. You just see through your perspective, but you have mm. to take a look at your perspective if you're going to. So um, while, you know, I have to say I'm enjoying all the attention these days with the book coming out. I've been waiting for a long time to be better known. I mean, my father and my brother actually have, you know, hundreds of mm. thousands of followers. And I've always thought, Hey, I have something to say. I'm, talented when's this going to happen for me and you know whatever i'll allow myself that it's i'm not proud of it but i'm not ashamed of it and and i'm also enjoying the ability to express myself the invitation to come on your show and many other shows it's really cool and being alongside my dad in public hmm. uh but when i get too caught up in the the hoopla and the hype that's not good for me either and and actually you know it's actually it's more a sign that something is off when I do take it personally. So if someone sends me a message being like, I'm, you're, you're so lucky to have Gabor for a father. And 
I feel a twinge inside mm -hmm. and it really bothers me and it mm -hmm. ruins my day. Well, that's a sign that something was out of alignment already because otherwise it's just like, okay, yeah. buddy, I'll just roll my eyes. Good for you. You're telling me about you more than you are about myself. Exactly. So it is in, in, in a certain way, I don't need to be too guarded against it because it's a useful lens on how I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Great. Right. And then what's my assessment of where's my relationship with Gabor at? Uh, where's my relationship with my mom? Where's my relationship with public attention and with myself? So it is what it is. It's inherently neutral, but as with everything, we don't experience it neutrally. We experience it very much depending on where we're at on that day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that I was thinking about talking about what you said is boundaries. As you talk about relationship and so on. And you mentioned this a lot in uh, the workshop of uh, Hello Again. And it, it made me think about what people think about boundaries. It's really like mainstream right now. And, and many times I can see people like take boundaries as a yes or no. It's like mm -hmm. I take it or not. And I think there's a lot of nuances. And there's something you mentioned that I tried. I didn't see it through that lens is when you say like relationships and environment with specific intentions mm -hmm. and when we want relationship and a conversation is how is the environment what environment should we create for yeah. that or what environment do i need or we need mm -hmm. and i thought it was really interesting way of seeing it that some sometimes people don't understand it as boundaries as well yeah i mean i think of uh, you look as you say, boundaries has become a mainstream buzzword. And anytime anything becomes a mainstream buzzword, to me, it's already lost its power in mm -hmm. a certain extent because mm -hmm. it's lost its specificity. Take a word like woke. There yeah. are so many words actually that that originate in African-American vernacular and not only vernacular, but political struggle. So what woke used to mean, as I understand it, people would say, stay woke brother to themselves to, to each other right in their community meaning stay aware mm -hmm. stay alert stay vigilant to the ways that the system is manipulating you and depriving you and gaslighting you and oppressing us right that's a very powerful concept and if we wanted to broaden a little bit to include the rest of us um you know not necessarily to appropriate it but to channel it in our own ways, then we could say, okay, stay aware, stay vigilant, stay awake, right? Mm -hmm. But it gets mainstreamed and then it just becomes another affect. Yeah. It becomes another brand. It becomes something corporations can talk about. And then all of a sudden, and then of course there's a backlash. And now the conservative reactionary elements are like, oh, woke this and woke that. And it's all just meaningless garbage. Like it's just nothing is being really discussed. And certainly there's no positive intention behind it nothing's being created and it's just more fuel for the for the the garbage fire that is popular culture so mm. all of that to say boundaries i think can be another example boundaries are a very personal intimate thing but you know it just turns into another kind of rigid identity marker yeah, and that's why I say the full yes and no, which is like a yes or no. Yes, or... no, it's like a stance, it's like mm. an attitude. Yeah. And that is a proxy for true autonomy. That is a that's a facsimile of actual self-knowledge. It's like if I have to write my boundaries out in stone and carry them around with me on a big tablet to remember who I am and then declare them all the time to everybody else, how much do I really feel confident in myself? And how flexible am I? Maybe my boundaries are like, you know, think of sexual boundaries. There are people with whom it's just an absolutely not never. There's people with whom it's like a hmm. And then there are people with whom maybe or yes. And even with one person, there are moments when, you know, <laughs> the gates come down, so to speak. Um, <laughs> it's a dynamic so relationship. It's dynamic, right? The boundaries are always shifting. Think of a, a, a dance, you know, a yeah. tango, any of this stuff. All of this is a dance. And anytime we reify it, which is to set it in stone, make it too solid, I think we lose the 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 real essence and the value in it. 
So to me, boundaries have lost their appeal as a as a concept, except to accept, I guess, to recognize that I was born, we were all born with a certain bodily integrity and emotional integrity and spiritual integrity. We needed that. That is every person's birthright. And every single one of us had one, two, and sexual integrity. And every single one of us had one or more of those violated in some way. Mm -hmm. So we are, we walk around confused. And when I was uh, confused at best, you know, mm -hmm. if not deeply turned around and disoriented and, and, and messed up. I think when I was nine, I said to my father in these words, I don't know where you end and I begin. And that's a sign of someone expressing boundary confusion. Yeah. So yeah, figuring out my boundaries and, and, you know, another word for boundaries would be definitions. Mm. You know, if a circle that you draw is well-defined, it means the lines are clear. You can tell where it is. So defining myself, but of course, definitions of self should shift with time, right? So yep. that it's, it, I'm fully with you in terms of the nuances. I'm really always eager for nuance. Um, you talk about uh, the environment. I yeah. think to me, um, a fresher concept, and I'm just, I'm just wondering about these things. I'm mm -hmm. just playing around with it. And of course, if this caught on and became a new mainstream buzzword, it would suck immediately too. So <laughs> no one listened to me. Never say this to anyone. <laughs> just keep it to yourself. But I think it's pretty good, which is not mm -hmm. boundaries, but conditions. Yep. Both in, in two senses of that word. One, environmental conditions. In what conditions do I thrive? in this relation in what conditions does this relationship thrive mm -hmm. so if you think about if you wanted to enjoy a movie and really get lost in the illusion of the picture and would you want to be in a bright sunny meadow or would you want to be in a darkened movie theater mm -hmm. obviously the movie theater is an environment that's a type of environment that's all it is which is explicitly created for one intention and one intention alone to give you a certain experience. And mm. the minute you walk in there, it's set for you. You don't have to work at it. Mm. Uh, fresh air and indoor air are two different kinds of environments and they immediately give you a different experience. So the intelligent thing, and also architect, like when, when, mm. when architects design buildings, a Starbucks is designed to give a certain customer experience, mm. right? Um, a jail is designed to give a very different experience. And also, um, I was I was thinking in terms of relationship and communication. I think people know it, understand it a little bit when you say, you know, when we have we have to have a hard conversation, you may go to a neutral place. It's like these are exactly the conditions right. of the environment. That is, those are different environmental conditions. Also, mm -hmm. conditions are created by certain agreements. So I'm not going to call you after 11 p.m. Or my father and I have an agreement that I don't talk to him when I've smoked pot because he really dislikes talking to me when I'm there. I'm not, you know, I get a little overexcited and whatever. Mm -hmm. And even if I really want to, it doesn't work. So we yeah. just have a, an agreement, right? Mm -hmm. um, so those are environmental conditions one agrees to. But then, of course, the word conditions also means, yeah, that can, that agreement side. Mm -hmm. Like these are my conditions. Yeah, it's a part of a negotiation, which mm -hmm. is you're negotiating the boundaries. If you think about the boundaries of countries, you know, la frontera. Uh, by the way, I was in an immigration jail in, in oh, Mexico yeah. about a year ago for for three and a half weeks, which is a whole other story. But I learned about you know, Mexico has immigration conditions, and if you break them, if you overstay your visa, like I did, you end up you're liable to end up in a pretty unpleasant set of conditions. You know, a country might have a different immigration policy, which is to say a tighter or a looser border at different times, depending what the internal situation is. Mm. If if there's massive unemployment and a whole lot of infrastructure work to do, we may not want so many people coming in. And that wouldn't be racist or xenophobic. It would be arguably a very reasonable position, right? Mm. On the other hand, if there's lots of opportunity and lots of extra land and lots of extra wealth 
and a desire to be more multicultural and more open, well, then you loosen your immigration restriction. Your boundary literally gets less stringent. Mm. So again, if the minute you create it as a new, this is who I am and you can't do this, you know, as opposed to, hmm, where am I at right now? Okay, here's as far as I want you to come. Boundaries do this too. Sometimes a dog will want to you to approach, be happy to have you approach, hold it, nuzzle it, wrestle with it, play with it. Another dog on another day will bite your freaking hand off. Yeah, absolutely. And there's something um, it reminds me of in my way, the way I've learned it is that it, you know, in a relationship, in a condition, is it's not about... I don't want to talk to you when you're bad. It's like I Very don't good. want I don't want to talk to you when this is happening in you or the be it's not the it's the behavior that I don't like, not you. And and I think yes, that's a absolutely very important this um distinction to do. And and it reminds me, you know, when you have the child, many parents will say, like, oh, you don't do that, you're a bad child. It's not your bad child, it's your behavior, which is so yes. different. So yeah, I agree with you. Although even there, there are nuances. So, you know, I think the workshop you're talking about was our very first, that's the one that's been viewed the most times on YouTube, although there are several. It's from mm, 2016. Yeah. It's been viewed like a four hundred thousand times. We got a little spicy with each other on on stage, but even more mm. spicy in the car on the way down. <laughs> and we talked about this on stage. Yeah. We had a big fight. Mm. I was like, I do not want to do this workshop with this person. He yelled at me. I yelled at him. And one of the things he said to me early in the fight, which just pissed me off so much was like, I don't like your energy right now. Mm. I don't want to talk to you when you have this energy. I'm like, what is this energy? What are mm. you talking about? Like, that's not object. Like, what did I say exactly? Mm. I'm asking you how long our talk is going to be. Okay. You don't like my tone of voice. There are ways of saying it, which is I'm not comfortable right now. <laughs> Yeah, sure. This doesn't feel safe. I'm not calm. There's something going on between us even that I can't it's, put my finger on, but it's it's not working for me. Yeah. But there's a subtle kind of, it's okay. still, it's your fault. Yeah, oh, sure. It's something yeah. about you, you know? Yes. And the fact is like, okay, if it's my energy, well, then it's going to come through no matter what words I use. So why don't you just take a break from me yes. and own it? Mm. like own it like a adult you know mm. and i'm sure i've done the same thing to him yeah so and you see couples do this all the time this subtle kind of gaslighty blaming thing through healthy sounding psycho spiritual language and that is <laughs> one of my pet peeves it's really really subtle and very manipulative and very tempting for those of us who have done a lot of work on ourselves mm. it's just a new fancier more enlightened way of being the same asshole. Yeah. Mm. If you don't mind Check using that language on your, on your <laughs> No, <podcast>. no, 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 no. <laughs> um, I'm conscious about the time. And there's so yeah, many I mean, questions I've, I've I have. Got, I've, I've got plenty of time, but if you have a hard cap. No, then... no, no, it's, it's good. But I had, I haven't been even like halfway to it. <laughs> wondering. So let's go to one thing, one main um topic I wanted to talk about, which is healing, which is actually mm. the fourth part of the book. So fifth. where you've got exercises, right? Yes, yeah, the fifth. And the definition, the fifth. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And you've got exercises. So can you tell me a little bit what type of exercises so you can like... Yeah, well, so these are my father's exercises. He, okay. he, he gets the full credit for these, you know, and they're ones that he's developed. He's adapted it from other people. Um, you know, he he breaks down, say, four A's of healing, mm. which are, you know, spoiler alert, uh, acceptance, agency, anger, as in healthy anger, and um, what's the fourth? Authenticity. Mm. And there's a fifth one he says he would have liked to have added if he had remembered uh, or he thought of it, which is awareness. Oh. And then mm. there are two extra ones in the social realm, advocacy and activism. Mm. There are act. Uh, there are. Uh, there's an exercise that he labels before the body says no. As a nod to his his second book. I've got uh, this one. Where Just you, to let you know. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good book. Um, where you take an inventory, you sort of keep tabs of where did I, where did my body give me a single that signal that I ignored, or where did I say yes when I meant to say no, and what was the impact on my body? Um, again, these are in some ways, chiropractic 
practices to reframe your understanding and really sensitize your awareness. They're mindfulness practices in a way. Yeah. Um, there's another exercise around letting go of limiting self beliefs. Mm. You know that in the chapter we call seeing as disbelieving. Mm. I take credit for most of the chapter titles. You know, I'm very, very proud of myself <laughs> on those. But uh, no, these exercises are his, and they're very effective. They're very, very, they're very. Um, they get right to the to the heart to the and point. they retrain you. They, 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 again, they align you with the intention to heal, which mm. is to move towards wholeness. Yeah. And they're very simple, but mm. if you can start to think that way, you'll be much more vigilant and um, kind to yourself, I think. Sure. And there's one thing that's, let's talk about myth, is mm. when people think about healing is a goal versus a journey. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because this, I mean, I can see it many times with people who may be scared about doing any therapy or development work. It's like, okay, yeah. but if I reach that, then I would be happy and then everything would be okay. And so what is your view on that? Absolutely. Um, healing is a direction, not a place. It's a movement, not a stopping point. And you only do it because you want to. You only do it because something in you is longing for it or aching for it. And you don't know where it's going to take you. It is risky. Mm. You know, it does mean letting go of some things. Uh, and I do find that once you get started, the door kind of only swings one way. So, you know, buyer beware. It is, it's not a casual in, uh, enterprise. But at the same time, it's not all at once. It's not all or nothing. It's not. Um, you don't need to put that kind of pressure on yourself. Um, and you talked about, it's interesting, you mentioned the word myth in relationship to healing. And one of the last sections of the book, which I insisted on, it was, uh, you know, it was in our book proposal. I wanted to do a whole chapter on it, but we ended up just sort of folding it into the chapter on spirituality, which is that the word myth has an older meaning, mm. which is a much more positive and empowering meaning. Um, which is to say mythic thinking mm -hmm. and understanding the universalities of being a human being and storytelling and seeing life as a journey and seeing the metaphors in things and seeing the wisdom in the things that happen and finding the gold in the pain uh, and finding the pain in the gold and just sort of connecting ourselves to a much, much bigger story than our own personal narrative or drama. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, when we participate in healing, we're really participating in, in a current, a, a direction somewhere that life wants to flow. And in some ways, you have to be stopping it in order for it not to happen, because everything wants to become itself. Every wound naturally wants to heal, the blood wants to coagulate, the tissue wants, but there's things you can do to keep the wound infected or to prevent it from healing. Absolutely. So healing is about not so much forcing some, certainly not forcing something, but participating in something that if you really tune into it, it's nature's agenda for you anyway. So why not ride the horse in the direction it's going? Mm. And that led me to one topic that is actually close to my heart. And to me, very, I mean, happening in a big scale might be wrong, but it's healing as a man. Because um, mm. for, for different reasons, first of all, in the personal development world, if you can see in most of the workshop, it's mostly women were there. <laughs> if I look at my Instagram mentions, it's almost, I mean, since the book came out, yeah, it's about 90% women. Exactly. And, you know, part of me doesn't mind that, but, but, much, <laughs> but no, no, I don't want to be one of those, one of those <laughs> people. Uh that that needs healing uh, <laughs> um but also i'm like come on dudes where are you like we are a big big part of this and if you think that male privilege uh is does insulates you from pain it's quite the opposite mm. so that's why i was i was wondering because that's that's the first thing and the second thing is um and i can relate with some with my colleagues is i've received you know, sometimes email from wives who say like, okay, can I book a session for my husband? He's ready. And, or, or 
sometimes it's mom who say, okay, my son has addiction. Like, can I book for him? Um, yeah, and, and everything I've seen so far when people try to do like men's work and workshop, it just doesn't work well. So mm. any thought on that, any recommendation? I know your background is a bit specific because of your upbringing, but is there anything that you could recommend or say? Um, there are individual teachers out there who work with men in ways that I think are, that I've found to be intelligent and helpful. And they're not only working with, so David Data is what I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know too much about him, but I've taken a course with him and I've read one of his books. It's called The Way of the Superior Man, which is not to say that men are supposed to be superior, but the higher level of of manhood but he doesn't just work with men he works with masculine identified women yeah. too yeah sure uh the, he works with the masculine principle mm. and polarity and relationships and um and how to relate to the feminine and, you know without get again without reifying it i think we can say that there is a masculine and feminine energy in the world that's one way of looking at it one way mm. of talking about it. I, don't, I don't think any of these things as dogmas or ideologies yeah. or literal beliefs are very useful but it is a it is something you can see in mm. the world if you look at it that way, if you look at flowers and bees and exactly. all that. So, uh, and human beings, certainly. So um, I think there can be really helpful ways of working with uh, masculinity and manhood. I've never done a men's group. Maybe I attended one once and I can see the value in it. Like it, it could be really fun and empowering. Maybe I think men do have a longing for each other mm. that in this culture is either sublimated into sort of superficial stuff like sports mm. and whatever. And that's not that that's bad, like going to a hockey game with my friend. I love it. Like it is a good way, you know, but we get kind of fixated on the, the minutia of sports and, and sometimes we're arguing about sports and we're, <laughs> we're not really arguing what we're really arguing about yeah um and uh, on the more toxic flip side of that is the way men gather and talk about women now again i've had great conversations with my male friends about my romance problems mm -hmm. but there are a lot of ways that this society trains men to get together and deepen their alienation from themselves and from women and to in fact uh, reinforce and um, uh, exacerbate the training men have to objectify women and to use them and to dismiss them and everything else. I think anything that re-entrenches well-worn and kind of obsolete grooves of culture, like, you know, women are like this and men are like this. Well, no, some are fine, mm. you know, like, um, I like things that subvert mm. uh, and not transgress or subvert again as an affect or like an attitude, but that, you know, I can see a men's group being both useful. I can see it being corny uh, and I can see it being kind of reinforcing of some of the premises um, that, uh, that keep us separate. But I also, again, nuance, nuance, nuance. My dad was on Joe Rogan recently. Yeah. And in my circles and on my side of the cultural divide that's become so wide in the past six years or whatever since Trump, and not only because of Trump, but also because of the reaction to Trump, mm -hmm. Joe Rogan is the toxic dude bro personified, mm -hmm. right? That is the way people talk about him. He's horrible. He's bigoted and all of this. And I have people very close to me who feel this way, very, very acutely and painfully that 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 show and that speaks to a culture in ways that reinforce um the marginalization of certain groups and i'm not going to argue with the merits of that particular thing i think it is true that in those spaces sometimes there is a tolerance of really just meanness and lack of compassion you know, and a kind of arrogant looking down on people or mm. a lack of at least an incuriosity, no mm -hmm. compassion and no inquiry. However, I also think Rogan is actually a very curious person at heart. And you see that in his interview with my dad. It's one of the best interviews my dad's ever done. Mm. I thought he was great. I thought Rogan was great. I thought Rogan was open. 
learned some things from him. I also think he's held his ground when he just didn't agree with what my dad said. They had an argument about failure that I thought Rogan won, quite mm -hmm. frankly. <laughs> I thought my dad was in a fixed sort of spiritual sounding position about it. And Rogan's like, no, you can actually fail at things. It's okay to admit that you failed. The point is when we, when we defend ourselves, when men uh, see the emergence of a softer, gentler ethic in society, the emergence of less rigid gender roles, gender expression, people blurring the traditional mm -hmm. boundaries between male and female, people identifying uh, as one sex or the other, um, and generally, or even questioning male supremacy, which if you don't think there is supremacy, male supremacy in the world, you're just not looking, right. you know, men feel attacked. Some mm. men feel attacked, guilty. Mm. There's the, you know, it's, uh, there's a perfect song that ex uh, embodies this Henry Rollins, the, the punk singer had a band called Rollins band. And in 1994, he put out a song called wrong man, where he's upbraiding browbeating this woman defensively like i'm not the guy who raped you stop looking at me like that we're not all like that it's the classic not all men mm. song mm. and it's really illustrative of a kind of male fragility like dude let this woman have her pain you know mm. that's one side of it at the same time when we castigate all when, when even the phrase toxic masculinity i prefer the phrase toxified max masculinity subtle difference but you can yeah. you can hear the difference right mm. it's not that masculinity is toxic in and of itself but that it's polluted there's some pollutants and if we could make it more pure it could actually be a contribution to the world mm. and one of the ways in which it could be more pure is if it allowed some of the feminine within yeah. one person or in another person so mm. You know, I'm I'm going off on a lot in a lot of different directions here. <laughs> no, but clearly, but... I I feel some kind of way about it. That 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 when you can, when you start to, when when men are talking about hunting or mixed martial arts, or drinking bourbon or smoking cigars or even talking about their attraction to women, and all you see is toxicity, mm. you're just pushing them further into their corner. Yeah, you're you're losing the masculine principle you're flipping you know and it's just this is true i think invariably what you resist persists yeah and it's possible to engage in political resistance and dissent and activism and being in the proper sense of the word woke to and advocating and trying to open people's minds and setting boundaries and saying no and all that without writing people off yeah that's and, what and and yeah that's and I what that i, when I to write say. myself off as a man it just doesn't it nothing changes no and that that's what I, when you were talking about joe rogan and all that is my take is people are still into the good and bad people mm -hmm. and i mm -hmm. and i think there's there's really good people with the dark side and the other and the other way around and yeah that just might take in the same of like a uh, bad masculinity. Well, there's, there's, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll give, you, give you a personal example. I was the most peace loving little kid. I would not go to a friend's birthday party if they were going to go see a movie with violence or gore in it. This is when I was, you know, age seven to 12. Mm. I was suppressing my anger, mm. my aggression, my rage. I grew up with a father who would rage uncontrollably at the drop of a hat. He just gave himself, and I was, I, hated it. Mm. I judged it and I was terrified of it. So mm. I was terrified of it in myself. I was also terrified of my sexual impulses until a very late age. Not morally, but just there was an out of controlness to it. There's a life force to it that was threatening mm. uh, in my experience. Then at age 12, I realized, ugh, if you can't beat him, join him. And I became a horror movie fanatic. I dressed up as Freddy Krueger for Halloween. I bought Fangoria magazine and you know, my friends would give each other high fives, good gore when we saw a violent scene in a, in a, in a movie. And I started listening to heavy metal, mm -hmm. which you think of as a very aggressive, macho thing. But actually, if you listen to thrash metal from the 80s, Metallica, mm -hmm. Megadeth sometimes, it's full of pain and mm -hmm. sorrow and angst and alienation and sadness. And then grunge came along yep. and Kurt Cobain e made it even more possible to... to um, to express vulnerability and and uh, 
you know, kind of primal scream and softness and, you know, he lyrics like God is gay and all this kind of stuff with this hard ass aggressive music. And I remember going to Lollapalooza and feeling like, oh, I'm in a world where like we can all kind of tap into different parts of ourselves. And yeah. it was very healing for me mm. to connect with that kind of music. And I became someone who, again, loves the Indigo Girls and Ani DeFranco and Bjork and Liz Fair and also loves Wu-Tang Clan and Metallica and Soundgarden and Slayer. Mm. Um, and I'm really proud of that. Like I, I, or at least I'm grateful for that. Like it feels yeah. like a balance in me of, and then fi the final piece was to embrace I guess my gay side, culturally speaking, and become a musical theater writer, you know, not, <laughs> not to not 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 to stereotype too much, but that kind yeah. of effervescent, ebullient, over the top, yeah. campy, even sometimes, and just unmitigated expression of joy and sadness and feeling yourself, you know, that's a part of me too that I had mm. suppressed mm. in an effort to be cool. Musical theater is the least cool thing in the world. Mm. And I can have all that. And I can still be a red-blooded heterosexual male, mm. but hopefully one who can look at women in a variety of ways and, you know, not try to use them to fill up these holes in me that can only be, you know, spackled and filled in and healed yeah. over time by me with intention. So... Mm. We're complicated, man. We're we're we're, <laughs> no, we're but, all very complicated, and um, I think I, we do ourselves a disservice when we try to reduce ourselves to this or that. Absolutely. So that's what that's what from what you were saying is. I don't know. It just an inquire me. I'm gonna sit with it and sleep. Is what if people would accept all the part of themselves instead of just trying to fit into something which is whatever. <laughs> As anyway. far as I know, that's the only thing that works, but only 100% of the time. <laughs> like if you reject any part of yourself, look out for the boomerang. It's coming back around. It's going to hit uh, or it's going to hit someone else in the head. You yeah. suppress it, it'll come out sideways. Think of when you depress a beach ball underwater. Mm. If you go too long, it'll just pop out like that, you know? Yeah. We, uh, we contain multitudes as... Uh, the American poet said, and um, um, I, I think a life worth living is one where we give ourselves the maximum bandwidth to be everything we are. Yeah, certainly. So um, just to go short on the book, because I know a lot of people can watch uh, or listen to podcasts where you've been interviewed with Gabor. So I would not repeat like what you've done beautifully. By the way, I would um I've seen the uh, live that you did on Instagram, which I recommend with your daughter. Oh, your daughter. Oh, your sister. There you go. <laughs> his, his daughter. <laughs> his daughter. But I think Although she is quite a bit she is quite a bit younger than me. She was born when I was 13. I know, I know. It's it's but but the thing is I found it really interesting because um there was like two different point of view from to me it was from more abstract to more concrete which was your sister and i think it would fit like many different generations so well and also you want to talk about masculine and feminine energy mm. yeah she, hannah is training to be a clinical psychologist and she just by nature is very soft and gentle and open and inclusive with people that's just mm. part of who she is and it's a beautiful thing and she's very sharp and she can tell when certainly my ego or my dad's ego are taking over or she's very attuned to how people might be listening and she wants mm. to make sure and that was a crew i mean it's so good to have her yeah moderate you know i tried to moderate an event with my dad on stage a few weeks ago here in new york it was a disaster <laughs> we ended up just fighting on stage because it's just like too yeah exactly you know it, it, it but... just it, there was just no so yeah it's a, I, I really enjoyed that she asked she channeled the questions very well and she kept us in line and and she yeah, gave concrete examples for about herself which i think was really interesting that, too yes mm -hmm. so the book myth of normal um i'm not going to go into details but i really love what someone wrote to you which says a love letter to the world and how to mm -hmm. understand yourself and the world we live in so yeah. mm, i would say for me i would recommend because it's like kind of all those book condensed in one <laughs> so it's all about 
from pregnancy to delivery to childhood to chronic chronic illnesses and environment. So I can to po do. to politics and to politics medicine. And and, I mean, it really yeah. has the widest lens of any of his books, and um, hmm. because it's looking at how none of these things we're dealing with in our individual bodies and minds are a coincidence or a accident or a glitch. They may not be intended by the system, but they are the inevitable yeah. consequence of mm -hmm. the way that our current system is set up and that it doesn't have to be that way. Not that there's ever been a time when human beings weren't selfish sometimes and you know, we're peaceful, loving, you know, we've never lived on star Trek, the next generation where, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, it's like, you know, oh, human beings obliterated war in the 23. Oh, good luck. I don't know. <laughs> um, but but we understood something about what it means to be from this planet and to be ourselves mm. and the ways we set up our societies. And we understood what health and illness were. And this beautiful quote from an, a half an, uh, a part indigenous uh, psychiatrist colleague of my father's who says that in, in his tradition, the Lakota tradition, when someone gets sick in the community, the community is grateful for it. And they gather around because they see that as an expression of something going on with them. Mm. That's just that's just intelligent. Yeah. That's yeah. just, I mean, that's just sensible, really, if we come mm -hmm. to all of our senses. Yeah. And as far as a love letter to the world, I love that. I mean, if you think what what is a love letter, you don't tell someone stuff they already know about themselves in a love letter. You tell them what you see mm. and you tell them you 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 mirror back to them their possibilities and who they are for you. And in a sense, what they're capable of, you 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 render them in the most generous, expansive, poetic language that leaves them with a different experience of themselves. And that's a big part of what love is about. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, by the end of this book, after we get done cataloging all of the fucked up things about how we live and about the about life now, mm. what we are pointing to, I hope and I think is. We are capable of so much more, you know, at yeah. least we have it in us, mm. whatever it is, we have it in us. And um, the world could be so many different ways, whether it will or not, we'll see. But why not live as if it could be and why not try? Because it's just, it's just so much more enlivening, even if it's doomed. Yeah. It's, um, it's a living death to just be resigned to what's so, what's already predictable. Hmm. And the other thing that I would say is, for instance, the first part, which is our interconnected nature, is for me two things that are major, I believe. is first thing is that we are not alone, one of those principles. And the second thing that everything influences us. So when people look at it from all the chapters, I think that's where people recognize themselves, like, oh, and actually I'm not alone. And that's what everything influences me. And, and actually that's one of the principle I, I forgot to mention that I use and we use in compassionate inquiry, which is self-disclosure, which doesn't happen in traditional therapy, which is like, hey, me too. I'm here. I'm human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a therapist, yeah. but I understand you through your pain. I've been through that and I know what it is. Mm -hmm. So I so don't you're know. Not some, uh, you're not some omniscient, objective, removed voice, you know, guiding them as patient, but you're it's an encounter between yep. two human beings. And, and of course, that um, doesn't just emulate or model, but it also activates our one aspect of our essential nature, which is interconnectedness. Absolutely. And we have to activate it. It's, can't, it's not just you can walk around being like, I am one with everything and put a bumper sticker on that we are all connected. No, you got to actually, again, the environment has to activate these instincts and these these innate characteristics otherwise they atrophy and die and get replaced with cope mm, absolutely which is what the society basically is made up of um mm. as one of my favorite authors stephen jenkinson says uh you know basically there are three major drugs in our world cope dope and hope not hope of the true possible but just sort of idle fantasizing yeah. and and deluding and checking out from reality and um, we, I think we can do better than cope. Mm. I think we can do a lot better than cope. We can, we can live yeah. and we can engage and we can thrive. 
and um, and and, and one do that thing as, as individuals and as groups and as a whole collective. Absolutely, and and one thing that you know, as I mentioned, the Enneagram, the way I learned it is through EPP, which is called Enneagram Prison Project. From which Gabor actually is board advisor. So it's is related. He? Yeah, among others. <laughs> I had no idea. You know what's interesting? If I could just cut in. Yeah, sure. Uh, a friend, a friend of mine who's, you know, maybe Canada's premier monologist. He's yeah. always every year he has a new show on the Fringe Festival circuit. Now, he may have toured it uh, in Europe. I don't know. Um, his name is T.J. Daw, and one of his shows was called Lucky Nine. And it's where I heard of the Enneagram first. Mm. And it it wove together three strands of three different things, pieces of literature, you could say, or pieces of art or creation that have strongly influenced him and the way he sees the world and his family and his relationship with his parents. One of them was the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. And he now runs a podcast called The Enneagram in a Movie, where he takes a movie every week and breaks down the mm. main character or he breaks down various movie stars in terms of what enneagram type they are mm. so there's the enneagram there was the hbo show the wire yeah whose tagline is all the pieces matter talking about interconnection mm. i had never heard of it at the time it's now one of my favorite shows i've watched it three times and the work of gabor mate there you go <laughs> and so but it's really cool. I didn't know my dad was involved with the Enneagram, but you were going to tell me something about there the you go. Uh, Enneagram approach. <laughs> yeah, so no. So, so yeah. just, no, no, it's okay. So by the way, you can find him um, through EPP. You can see some of his video when he's been in prison in, I forgot which one, but uh, yeah, he's been in prison with Susan, what's her name again? Olsek, which is the founder of EPP because they go into his prison and then they try to um, heal people through that and they go out of jail, which is cool. But right. what I was talking about is one thing we say many times is the the sentence we heard in relationship and we healed in relationship. Mm. And that's, I think, one of, I mean, I don't know, for me, that's one of the major things I hold on to. So It's uh, very true. I would add the corollary that we train for healing by ourselves mm. or or we can you know that that we're not always going to be around people oh, sure. other people are great catalysts for healing and, and ultimately that relational healing needs to happen we spend a lot of time with ourselves and in our own minds and at least for me maybe it's my enneagram type as the individualist but um contemplation mm. you know as Billy Joel said, either way, it's okay. You end up with yourself. And uh, the fact is we die alone, even if we're surrounded by people. Sure. We face our death as our death. And um, there is something ultimately, there's a signature, there's a frequency that belongs to each of us uniquely, I think. And so we can train ourselves along the path of healing so that when we come into these relationships, we're more receptive, we're more open, we're more intentional. Mm. Um, so I think both both, both are- Both works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't think either one is complete without the other. Mm. Daniel, I have a small gift for you. So just to let you know, the idea of the podcast is for me to make people who have a common interest to meet each other, literally. Yeah. And usually there's one people who would say hi. Uh, in your case, I have a small team behind. So if you want to grab a cup of coffee and uh, watch the videos I'm showing to you, there you go. There's the coffee. <laughs> Thank you. This is lovely. I thought you were going to gift me with a, a you know a one way ticket to Spain so I could come and <laughs> next time. Hang next out. time. <laughs> This is amazing. I, I can't wait to meet these people. <laughs> so I'm just going to share my screen and I'm going to go one by one. So be ready. Because the first one is Dylan Newcomb. He's one of my teacher. Uh, so just to let you know the connection. Um, Dylan Newcomb studied in the Juilliard School in New York. I don't know if you know that school of arts and the music. Juilliard School? <laughs> there you yes, go. I know the Juilliard School. <laughs> so my goodness. So he studied there dance and music. And then uh, he went to, as a choreographer in the Netherlands and so on. But the thing is, 
since like for like 20 years is studying somatics and the dynamics between each other which is called uzazu which actually is like a meta frame of somatic where you can include like somatic experiencing and so on it's a mm. big uh, theorist around that and he lives in maine so that would be the first one for you i have been meaning to go you know what maine is the one u.s continental state uh besides alaska you know but the 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 one state of the lower 48 that i have not driven through there you go you've got one excuse <laughs> yeah hi daniel nice to meet you i'm dylan newcomb and thank you stephanie for making this introduction and uh inviting me to uh connect so yeah it's uh it's been lovely to research and get to know a little bit about your work and life daniel and uh in music and in the arts in psychology and the work you've been doing with your father gabor uh very inspiring to me um and as i as i looked into your life and work a little bit um I think I, I started to see why Stephanie might have invited me to connect to you. Um, we have a few things in common, it seems. I uh, I come from a background in the arts, um, in dance, and also in classical, contemporary classical music composition, um, and went off to Europe to be a dancer, choreographer, composer for about 20 years, and then got increasingly into somatic psychology and um, not really arts, arts based, but arts inspired movement and sound inspired uh, ways to promote self regulation um, and co regulation, shifting states. And that's been really the focus of my life for the last almost 20 years now is being in that space. And I, I still practice the arts a little bit, but primarily I, I draw on that as my background or as one of the key pieces of my background in the work that I do, which is called Uzazu Embodied Intelligence, which is a way of moving the body in space to uh, first discover what ways of being in ourselves and in space are comfortable or edgy or uncomfortable or unfamiliar to us and what that can awaken in our natural embodied intelligence about what, what ways of being self-regulating, co-regulating, showing up are, are possible. And uh, it's been lovely to start to get to know your work a little bit. And I, I love this notion uh, that I encountered from you of the, the power of walking and talking. Um, I've certainly um, gone through periods in my life where that's been really, uh, really potent and valuable for me. Um, underneath it all, that alignment of just the body mind interaction, right? And how it's so bi-directional, how moving our bodies uh, in space uh, sets up this dynamicism that awakens our innate intelligence. Um, and what happens when we listen to that and attend to that and honor that. Uh, I look forward to getting to know more of your work and perhaps meeting sometime. I, I always love, um, people who are in that intersection of, of arts and therapy and human growth and potential. Uh, I believe there's so much potency that can be awakened in people uh, when they're allowed to and, and supported and inspired to live beyond the confines of, of the conventional uh, ways of being in in their body minds and with each other so uh have a great talk with stephanie she's a wonderful wonderful person to to talk with and uh i look forward to uh to getting to know more about your work all the best to you bye-bye john Bodel. so john uh is a comedy improv so we go to the other side it's comedy improv and a poet so he's been uh, sharing for the last years 
poems around emotional states. And actually, it's quite famous on social media. It has some poems who have been shared up to 6 million times. And I've seen wow. many people who've shared his poetry through compassion inquiry groups and so on. Mm. So this one is for you. Hey, Daniel. My name is John Rodell, and I'm a five foot two penguin shaped poet out of Wyoming in the middle of nowhere. And when Stephanie reached out to me to connect me to you in this amazing way, honest to goodness, I was completely humbled and a little bit nervous because I do know who you are. I have seen your work before, and it was only until recently that I really started to immerse myself in it. But let me just say this, I want to thank you on behalf of the people that you serve, including myself. And when I say serve, I really mean it. The way in which you create art, the way that you give us all permission to, to find the words in our heart, the way that you live your life and you reflect light off of yourself is an absolute example for the rest of us to do the same thing. I, I see what you do as service and it's something that I aspire to do myself. On behalf of myself, who, who only recently found the value in excavating these words that I buried in my heart for years and to be able to dig out and find them and put them in the light of day for other people to see, I find value in that and it's changed my life, but to find to see the way that you do it so effortlessly and in so many different formats and so many different ways of storytelling and singing and just sharing your heart with the rest of the world. You have no idea the ripple effect that you have caused and, and, the, and the lives you've probably saved and hearts you've opened up. So thank you so much. And, now, and the one thing I didn't know about you is uh, your mental uh, chiropractic uh, journey you're on. What an amazing, way to take your gifts and talents and to put them in the hands of people like me that we can we can find easier ways to share ourselves and to live our lives with more authenticity so daniel it, it is you probably hear this a lot but i'm going to say it from the bottom of my heart thank you Thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you for the way you share your life. Thank you for being a lighthouse for the rest of us, people who aspire to connect with our hearts in the way that you do. So thank you so much from a, a, a dude in Wyoming you've never heard of. Um, and maybe you don't even know anyone from Wyoming, but in case I'm the first person from Wyoming, I'm literally the only person here who doesn't wear a cowboy hat. So, you know, don't don't let this like, this is not what Wyoming looks like. We're, they're usually covered in barbed wire and spit and tobacco. But anyway, uh, thank you so much. I'm honored to have been connected uh, with you like this. Please keep sharing yourself and uh, yeah, keep, keep changing the world, man. Thank you. Oh my you God. Go. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say. That was amazing. I, that hit me. Yeah, it's a nice one. Huh? Can you yeah. breathe and have an, another one? This one is 30 seconds. I can, yeah. Uh, he is the first person I, I think I met from Wyoming. Uh, the only other reference point I have is Dick Cheney. And uh, <laughs> this is quite an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> I like, what's his name again? John Rudel. John, yeah. John, mm. I, I I like many things about you, but in particular that you're, well, including that you're not a war criminal. <laughs> that I know of. Yeah, that we are aware of. And, but, but, now, but now I have an extra reason to visit Wyoming because that, that dude seems like, I think we'd, I think we'd have a, a real blast. Mm -hmm. That was, that was amazing. Okay. You got mm. more for me. I can't believe it. <laughs> So the next one is 30 seconds. So um, do you know like uh, Pink, Coldplay, Rod Stewart? Yes. Yeah. So this message is from Brother Coran. They're called Brother Coran. So they've been the first part of those artists for a few years. And now what they do is they use... Do you mean they've, they've opened for them in concert? Yeah. 
And uh, so the two brothers coming from Australia, but now they're in the US, they are in California, so it's a bit far away, but who knows. Mm -hmm. And now they use uh, the skills they found through the voice for people to find purpose, self-love, and share their story. So they use, they have some work now with the ship network. I don't know if you're aware of that. It's a big uh, entity who work with personal development. So they had uh, something for you as well. Hey, this is a message for Daniel. This is the brothers Corin. Uh, we're, we had the pleasure of uh, being interviewed by Stephanie and uh, we've checked out your work, Daniel, and it's incredible. Your lyrics, your theater work, your work with your dad, who's amazing as well. Um, we have so much in common. We can't wait to meet you. Perhaps Stephanie can introduce us, but um, have a great interview and perhaps uh, we'll cross path in yeah. real time. Looking forward to it. Cheers. Cheers. How lovely. <laughs> I guess. The last one was someone who couldn't talk yesterday because he's too sick and had no voice, but it's Bruce Cryer. So I don't know if you know Bruce Cryer. So he's been, in that case, he studied in Oberlin, but he's been doing Oberlin Conservatory, which is also mixing like arts and so on. That's in Ohio. I right? think so. I think so, yeah. Yeah. I have friends who went to Oberlin. Yeah. And uh, he's been doing. 800 performances of the Fantastics in Broadway. So I mm. kind of know the word about that. And wow. since then, he's been for 20 years the CEO of something called the Heart Math Institute. Okay. I don't know if you're aware of that, but I will, you'll check it out. It's basically Heart, Heart Maps? Heart Math Institute. Oh, math. So it's huh. like they, they found out a way to have a coherence with their heartbeats. So that oh wait a minute! Is there a, there's an app, right? They were an app, a couple, yeah. A yeah. couple of years ago, everyone I knew was using the HeartMath app. Yeah, so it used to to work for twenty years with cool. the HeartMath Institute, and yeah, and he couldn't say hi because he had no voice and he had to. But he wanted to say hi, and now he's working as a director of the Salem University Integrative Health Institute. You can see my friend, and he works at Stanford. So this one is West Virginia. So you've got another one. I, another state that gets a <laughs> total bad rap. I love West Virginia, and it's much much closer to me than Wyoming. Yeah. So, like, I can get I can get to West Virginia in you know five or six hours of driving. So exactly. great. So that was it for the small team. Mm. And um, yeah, just, so just as a reminder for you, you have the book The Myth of Normal, which is a bestseller. Um, as far as I recall, for what I've heard, you have the Hello Again workshop that are coming in October and November, right? That's right. Yeah. So at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York, which is two hours north of New York City, mm -hmm. um, that's October 29th and 30th with a public talk on the 28th. So regardless of whether you're registered in the weekend workshop, you can attend the public talk and you can stream that public talk from anywhere in the world. So if you go to the Omega Institute website uh, and search for our program, Hello Again, um, you'll find that. And then we're doing it in our hometown of Vancouver at the end of November. Mm -hmm. Podcast and coming. We, we are in talks to do a podcast um, that will likely launch in the middle of next year or the fall. Okay. But uh, yeah, and we're writing, we're writing that book. That's our next book. And uh, uh, that one is even much more personal to me than the myth of normal was because that one you know myth of normal is my dad's work below again is both of us and yeah. it's all of us you know mm -hmm. absolutely and then yeah. we can find you as well as they say with a mental chiropractic and work with daniel walk with daniel.com and if anyone wants to check out my musical theater yeah. ditties uh daniel i have a youtube channel and one of the nice things about being a musical theater writer is that much better singers and musicians than me get to perform my stuff most of the time. So there's a lot of videos of some of Broadway's best um, and TV's best um, singing uh, my stuff, which is just always such a thrill. Mm. So great. It's all out there. 
Great. And I'm on I'm on I'm on Twitter and Instagram, all that, Daniel. Oh yeah, so people too. can find you. Great. Yeah. Mm. One thing before we leave that I always ask is if you had one wish, what would that be? <laughs> Simple question. <laughs> mm. For three more wishes uh, <laughs> that's that's cheating um i guess if it was a personal wish uh it would be um to know that i'm not going to die in some kind of accident that my life isn't going to be cut short by some sort of like physical circumstance outside of my control that would at least seemingly artificially cut short the amount of time I have to do what I'm supposed to do here. Mm. I can't control when my body gives out or the manner in which it gives out. And I think as Stephen Jenkinson so beautifully has written about, we live in a death phobic culture. So I don't want to wish for eternal life that that's, that goes against our nature, but you know, I'd be kind of bummed if I, if I uh, I knew that you know I was going to get pushed on a subway track or crash in a plane or mm. something stupid like that, um, and I, I guess I'd also wish. I mean, I could wish for stuff for the the world and stuff. I wish for everybody that they have all the time they need. Um, but I, I just, uh, yeah, I, I wish I wish for more opportunities to express who I am and, and discover all the ways in which I can express who I am and and there are other things you know I'd like to be on Broadway I'd like to have a show on Broadway but who knows but this is this isn't that you didn't ask me what I would ask from Santa Claus <laughs> not this time <laughs> that's a want a want list yeah <laughs> Daniel it was a pleasure to have you today and thank My you. goodness, Stephanie, this is, uh, I knew I was going to enjoy myself. I didn't know I was going to enjoy myself this much. So thank you so much for creating this environment in which this conversation could take place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you're new, don't forget to subscribe and let me know what you have enjoyed along this conversation. You can still watch other of the interviews that has been done under Unknowingly Connected, where you can learn a lot about the body-mind from a scientific and eventually spiritual perspective. And don't forget, it's all connected and we might not even know it. See you soon. <laughs>